President, I, I, I'm reminiscent with the snow on the ground uh, of, of five years ago. Uh, and the, the occupier of the chair, I say, Mr. President, was not here at that time. And so you don't have the advantage of knowing the story that's behind this. And the story that's behind this was that's back when they first started all the hysteria on global warming. And it happened to be another a, a snowstorm that had been unprecedented. It set a record that year. And there's a charming family of six, I say to my friend in the chair, that, um, that built this. And their picture is here. And that happens to me, my daughter and her family of six. And uh, at that time, it got a lot of attention. It actually, got a lot of, of uh, national attention. And in, in case we have forgotten, because we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record, I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball. And that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonal. So here, Mr. President, catch this. Mm -hmm. um, we hear the perpetual headline that 2014 is, has been the warmest year on record. But now the script has flipped. And I think it's important, since we hear it over and over and over again on the floor of this Senate. Some outlets are referring to the recent cold temperatures as the Siberian Express, as we can see with the snowball out there. This is, this, is, this is today, this is reality. Others are printing pictures of a frozen Niagara Falls, 4,700 square miles of ice that formed on the Great Lakes in one night. It's never happened before. So let's talk more about the warmest year claim. On January the 16th, NASA's Goddard Institute of, of Space Studies and the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, that's NOAA, concluded that 2014 was the warmest year in modern record, which starts uh, in 1880. Uh, NASA relied on readings from over 3,000 measuring stations worldwide and only found an increase of just two one-hundredths of a degree over the previous record. Now, an important point that was left out of the NASA press release was that, that the margin of error, which on, uh, on average is 0.1% degree Celsius, several times greater than the amount of warming. And so in reality, it is so far within the, real, the margin of error that it is not really recordable. This discrepancy was questioned at a press conference and NASA's GISS director backtracked. This is the, the uh, Goddard Institute of Space Studies. He backtracked on the warmest year headline saying there was only a 38% chance that 2014 was the warmest year on record. Another recent report issued by the Berkeley Earth uh, Surface Temperature Project using data from more than 30,000 temperature st uh, stations uh, concluded the, uh, the, uh, the, the, in the event, if 2014 was the warmest year on record, it was by less than 0.01 degrees Celsius. Again, below the margin of error, ultimately making it impossible to conclude that 2014 was the warmest year. Additional climate experts, including the University of Oklahoma geophysicist uh, David Deming, had uh, stated, have stated that the warmest year on record statement is only irrelevant when the record actually began. Others state that the record setting conclusions issued by in the January require the use of incomplete data because the preponderance of the data uh, 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 arrives much later from uh, underdeveloped and developing nations. By the way, I've just been reminded that in order to use a prop on the floor, I have to get unanimous consent. So I would like in retrospect the record uh, to show that I uh, did this prior to my remarks, unanimous consent that, uh, that the, I be permitted to use a visible example of the cold weather. Without objection. Thank you very much. Got to keep uh, everything straight here. The media was quick to ditch the warmest year on record claim as cold weather uh, has left most of the country experiencing record low temperature. Tuesday's Washington Post highlighted all of the long-standing records that were broken in the Northeast and Midwest. Now, my state is Oklahoma, uh, and that's not even included 
in, the, in this article. But we set 14 records, all-time records, in my state of Oklahoma just during that time. And according to the National Weather Service, 67 record lows were broken on Monday and Tuesday of this week. Now, whether news cycles or climate cycles, variations of hot and cold are really nothing new. Recent climate change discussions like to focus on climate trends post-1880, but the reality is that climate change has been occurring since the beginning of time. Now, we uh, have the medieval, yes, uh, this chart right here is very interesting because it shows one thing that all everyone agrees with. And that shows two things that everyone agrees with. Uh, first of all, is that we had the medieval warm period in the period of time starting about 1000 AD going to about 1400 AD. This was a major warming period. That led into what they called the Little Ice Age, which is from uh, 1500 to about uh, 1900 AD. The interesting thing, many of you in this room uh, remember that that when they first started talking about global warming, uh, a, a scientist named uh, Michael Mann developed what they called the, ho the hockey stick uh, theory. And that had a hockey stick showing that for a long period of time we had temperatures that were level, then all of a sudden they started going up like the blade of a hockey stick. The problem was that he neglected to note that, the, that the, those two periods were a reality in his sketch of a hockey stick. So in his opinion then, as portrayed by the hockey stick, there was no medieval warming period or little ice age. Now, by the way, this Hiram Mann is the same one that was featured as the, the main person who was in, uh, guilty of violations that created this thing called uh, the Climate Gate, which was characterized as the most uh, outrageous, um, uh, 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 I don't have my, in my notes here, but one of the, uh, the, uh, the publications in England talked about it as the worst uh, scientific disgrace in history. Now, the Time Magazine had a chart. Now, this is the interesting thing because people who look at the weather and get all concerned about the warming periods and the cold, then to them, the world is coming to an end. So this one right here shows that in 1974, another ice age was coming. And that's the, that's the, the actual cover of the, of the magazine. And so uh, everyone is concerned that the world's coming to end. At that time, they were talking about the fact that it is going to be another uh, ice age. In the past 2,000 years, there was the medieval warming period followed immediately by the Little Ice Age. These two climate events are widely recognized in scientific literature. No one has refuted these. These are incontrovertible. Uh, the, um, in 2006, the National Academy of Science released its study, surface temperature reconstructions in the past 2,000 years, and that acknowledged that there were rel it was relatively warm conditions during that period of time. So that's history, that's behind us. I like sometimes to, uh, well, while that's still up, I'll, I'll go on and fast forward. Uh, the, that same magazine, Time Magazine, had as its uh, uh, cover, a short time after that, this uh, poor pitiful polar bear who's standing on the world's last piece of ice and we're all gonna die because uh, 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 global warming is coming. So this is something that has been happening over a long period of time and every time it does, everyone tries to say that the world's coming to an end and somehow man is so important and so powerful that he can change that. The, uh, 1975, News, uh, Newsweek published an article entitled The Cooling World, arguing that global temperatures were falling and terrible consequences for food production were on the horizon and all of that. Well, we know, we know about that. This highlights that the climate is changing, and it always has been changing. Uh, in fact, our recent vote during the Keystone uh, XL pipeline debate showed that 97 of us in this, in this uh, chamber um, uh, Democrats and Republicans agreed that climate has always been changing. I made a little talk on the floor at that time. I said, you know, I think this is something we can all agree in. If you look at any of the archaeological diggings, the history, the scriptures, uh, uh, climate has always been changing. And despite a long list of unsubstantiated uh, global warming claims, 
Climate activists and environmental groups will cling to any extreme weather-related headline to support their case for global warming and to instill the fear of global warming in the American people. You know, that's, and people sometimes ask me why. Why do you suppose they're doing this, spending all this time in trying to pass the, they tried it through legislation, we defeated it, now through regulation that would cost between three and four hundred billion dollars a year, and yet it, it wouldn't have any effect on, on what they perceive to be global warming. So they ask the question, why is it? There's a scientist by the name of Richard Lindzen. Richard Lindzen is with MIT. Some have argued he's the most uh, the, uh, outs most knowledgeable of all the climate scientists. And he answered that question. He said, you know, regulating carbon is like regulating life. If you regulate carbon, you, it's a bureaucrat's dream because regulating car carbon regulates life. And so it's a power struggle. And, the, and I think that's probably the best answer. You know, I'm not a scientist and I don't claim to be. But I, I quote scientists, and, and they have the answers to these questions. Now, President Obama is using a similar tactic in order to scare Americans into supporting his extreme climate change agenda. In uh, a recent interview, President Obama agreed that the media overstates the dangers of terrorism while downplaying the risks of climate change. His press, press secretary, uh, Josh Earnest, later reiterated, uh, reiterated that President Obama believes climate change affects far more Americans than terrorism. Now that's the first time we heard that, but wait till you hear later on what the president himself and his secretary of state said. According to the president, the biggest challenge we face is not the spread of Islamic terror extremism in Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, or Nicaragua. And the, the greatest uh, threat that we face is not Russian aggression in NATO and the U.S. as well as its uh, invasion of Georgia and Ukraine. It's not the expansion of Iranian influence and sponsorship of terrorism throughout the Middle East or its pursuit of a nuclear weapon and a system to deliver it to be able to hit the United States of America. And the greatest challenge, threat is not uh, North Korea's continued development of its nuclear weapons stockpile and the improving uh, their delivery systems to include January 23rd launch of a sea-launched ballistic missile, uh, which is called the KN-11. I think we're all aware of that. And the greatest threat is not the continued capture and killing of reporters, missionary, businessmen, Christians, and other uh, and other uh, non-Muslims in what has clearly been a religious confrontation being pursued. The president's position is that global warming is our greatest threat, greater than all the things I just mentioned, and is underscored by the fact that he won't even publicly state that the 21 Egyptians executed by ISIL in Libya were Christians. And he won't recognize that, won't recognize it has anything to do with... with uh, 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 with the radical Islam. He goes out of his way to downplay the, play the actions and dangers of ISIS, even though the group continues to terrorize the world. Just this past weekend, ISIS abducted over 70 Syrian Christians, including women and children from villages in eastern uh, uh, Syria. To my knowledge, we don't know what they've done with them yet, but that's 70 of them, and the, and the previous 21 were killed uh, because of their Christianity. According to the president, our biggest threat is not the continued threats made by extremists against the United States and its citizens. It's not the successful attacks carried out in the United States in places such as New York, Boston, and Fort Hood, or potential attacks of lone wolves or sleeper cells against soft targets like the Mall of America, uh, which is the most recent subject of an ISO threat. And we had at that, that yet even as the, these atrocities are taking place, President Obama is telling the world that climate change is a greater threat to our nation than terrorism. This is just another illustration that this president and his administration are detached from the realities that we're facing today and into the future. His repeated failure to understand the real threat to our national security and inability to develop a coherent national uh, security strategy has put this nation as a, at a level of risk that is, has been unknown for decades. 
His failure of leadership and gutting, his gutting of our military have weakened our ability to influence and respond to crises. Uh, this all comes at a tremendous cost to our national security. The president has accused the media of overstating the problem, heightening the fears of uh, fear of population as he downplays the threats. And we see photos of young children standing in military-like formation. Uh, being brainwashed into ISIS or ISIL extremism. We shouldn't be surprised at this. It's a, a natural outgrowth of the president's failed leadership. In 2012 and 2013, uh, President Obama spoke of helping Libya and Yemen fight terrorism. Yet, as he addressed this nation, both countries spiraled toward chaos, creating terrorist safe, heaven, uh, safe havens. Just days after his speech, Yemen's prime minister and his cabinet resigned amidst a coup by the, uh, by the Iranian-backed Houthi uh, rebels. The administration aided instability in Afghanistan by releasing the most senior leaders of the Taliban, the Taliban dream team. We all remember that. You know, we had just passed a law saying that the president cannot release anyone from uh, Gitmo, from uh, Guantanamo Bay, without giving 30-day notice to, uh, to Congress. And yet he totally ignored that and let these people go. Uh, it's, uh, some, uh, some of the uh, terrorists out of Gitmo. And I carry this card with me because it's really not a believable thing. Of the five that he, that he turned loose, uh, one of them's name was Mohammed Fazil. And the, the uh, Taliban commander said, and this is a quote, the president's release, uh, uh, Mohammed uh, Fazil's release is like pouring 10,000 Taliban fighters into the battle on the side of jihad. Now the Taliban have the right lion to lead them in the final moment before victory in Afghanistan. And now we don't know where these are. I suggest they're probably all five uh, have returned to the battle. Uh, that's our, the record is that uh, of, of those who have been released, some 29% have gone back to the battle. So that is uh, taking place. That's uh, 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 Mular Omar, the Taliban's leader, called the release a great victory. Now, this action allowed these men to rejoin the fight against our servicemen and women. This is a big deal, you guys. The president quickly withdrew from Iraq leaving the uh, vacuum for ISIS to fill, which is now requiring our military to return. The president wants to repeat our errors with a speedy withdrawal from Afghanistan. And this is in spite of the fact, that the advice of the commanders on the ground and request by the Afghanistan's newest uh, new president, uh, President Ghani, to re-examine our withdrawal plan. He has de-Reaganized Europe by drastically cutting our forces, acquiescing to Russian influence by cutting our ballistic missile de defense site in Poland and our radar in the Czech Republic. I remember when that happened, I was so concerned about that because uh, we, were, we put the radar site and the uh, ballistic missile defense site in Poland in the Czech Republic because that was for the protection of Western Europe and Eastern United States and because we don't have the capacity to offer the protection the American people should expect. But he did that anyway. And by failing to provide assistance in uh, uh, the part of the MREs and, the, and sending a set of uh, weapons to help the Ukrainians, uh, he sends blankets. You know, we had Poroshenko come in and uh, the president of uh, Ukraine and give a speech to a joint session of, the, of Congress. And in that speech, he says, we, we need to have some defenses against what Putin and the Russians are doing with the separatists in his country of Ukraine. I happen to be over there, Mr. President. I, wa I was over there uh, during the parliamentary elections. And not many people in America realize that in the Ukraine, our very good friends in the Ukraine, they had their parliamentary elections in, in October. And uh, President Poroshenko, looked me in the eyes and he said very proudly how, what the outcome was. This is the first time in 96 years that the Ukraine had parliamentary elections, didn't elect one communist to, as a seat in parliament. That's the first time that that's ever happened. And yet the uh, president detailed in the State of the Union message, we're upholding the principles of bigger nations, can't bully the small ones by opposing Russian aggression, supporting Ukraine's democracy, and reassuring our NATO allies. That's what he said, standing in the, in the, in the House chamber in his joint speech of the State of the Union. 
And yet, under the president's failed leadership, we have seen two ceasefire uh, failures in the Ukraine, thousands of civilians displaced, and approximately 5,000 people killed. America's assistance is vital in, in uh, to denying Putin's attempts to destabilize the region. Yet, it's not happening. It's not happening in, under the Obama administration. This administration is overwhelmed by world events and blind to the fact that terrorists are at war with America and our way of life. We now live in a world where our allies don't trust us and our enemies don't fear us. When will the president and the administration take steps required to minimize the risk to Americans and our allies by providing this country with a national security strategy? One, one that addresses today's global security environment, grows back our military and its readiness, and deals with our enemies from a position of strength, not weakness, and not appeasement. These are the biggest threats facing our nation today. It's uh, decidedly not global warming. The threat of war, terrorism, and extremism have plagued the earth from, for centuries. The uh, United States is not immune. We must take all threats seriously and take every responsible action to secure our freedom. Threats to our national security are always the most serious threats we face. Issues like global warming or global cooling 40 years ago are simply not what we need uh, to be worrying about at the same thing we were talking about national defense. And you know, I say this because I have a deep concern. I was the ranking member on the Senate Armed Services Committee. I'm in a position to see what is happening around the world. And the threats that we're facing are unprecedented, uh, Mr. President. The, just, just yesterday, we had a hearing. We had James Clapper, who's the uh, 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 director of Central Intelligence. He's the one who said, looking back over my now more than a half century in intelligence, I've not experienced a time when we've beset, been beset by more crises and threats around the world. And at the same time, we had the national, uh, he had stated previously, quote, when the final accounting is done, 2014 will have been the most lethal year for global terrorism in the 45 years such data has been compiled. So this goes on and on. This is what the military says. This is the threat that we face. Everyone understands this except the White House. It was just yesterday, or I guess it was a couple of days ago, that Secretary of State Kerry said, stating that was on the 25th of, of, of February. He said, quote, now keep in mind all these threats that we're facing, he said, today is actually despite ISO, despite the visible killings that you see and how horrific they are, we are actually living in a period of less daily threat to Americans and to the people of the world than, than normally. Less deaths, less violent deaths today than throughout the last century. We all know better than that. We know how uh, threatened we are, and everyone knows it except the White House, and they're going to have to wake up to save our nation. With that, Mr. Um, President, I'll yield the floor and suggest an absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. <clears throat> 